One TV station that has followed up is WLOS-TV in Asheville, North Carolina. That's where the NCDC is headquartered. WLOS reporter Frank Proboni did a special report, including a response to the charges in our story, now via satellite. After hearing about the complaints about the NCDC and the allegations that they were manipulating data, we decided to take the information from global warming skeptics and present it to the scientists at the NCDC here in Asheville to get their response. Scientists at Asheville's National Climatic Data Center say they have the proof. These time series in recent years. Tom Peterson is a research meteorologist at the NCDC, which has fueled the global warming belief. I was hired by NOAA's National Climatic Data Center here in Asheville in 1991 to start building their global historical climatology uh, network, their database of global stations that we use for climate change purposes. Changes that reflect rising global temperatures, with the last decade being the hottest on record. Supporters blame increased greenhouse gases caused by burning fossil fuels and human activity. There's a, a variety of sources of information we have that, that arrives at that really unescapable conclusion. I mean, we have instrumental records. But those records are now being questioned by critics who claim temperatures collected from weather stations around the country are inaccurate. The information is, is filing up. Joe DeLeo is a licensed consulting meteorologist, a former professor and scientist who helped create the Weather Channel. He says a study by meteorologist Anthony Watts discovered serious problems with the reliability of stations recording surface temperatures. The study looked at 865 out of 1,200 climate monitoring stations like this one in Hendersonville. The survey found that almost 90 percent failed to meet the National Weather Service's own requirements for first-class reporting stations. Volunteers photographed hundreds of surface temperature stations around the country, commonly known as Stevenson screens or cotton regional shelters, placed near buildings, paved parking lots, and rooftops. Places that, uh, that produce a warm bias. Are you familiar with Anthony Watts? Yes. Yes, I'm familiar with it. NCDC scientists know about Watts' study. Peterson says it's true. Stations don't conform to the National Weather Service's own standard, requiring placement 100 feet from artificial heat sources. If you look at the photographs that he's collected around, around the country, it seems to paint a, a picture that there is a serious problem with the network. Critics say the temperature record gets worse. When stations modernized installing electronic thermistors like this one, placement got worse, limited by cables and wires. The site in Hendersonville is just a few feet from a satellite dish and building and only inches from a paved parking lot. There's an issue with, with regards to siting of instruments. Recognizing the National Weather Service sites had problems, the NCDC took Watt's study and did its own data analysis. And it turns out that there is a bias associated with the move to these poor stations, but it's actually a cold bias. The newer thermostores read colder than the older cotton region shelters. So this is a cold bias that we've recognized since uh, the mid-90s, and we've been adjusting the data set to try to compensate to account for that, that particular bias to make our record as unbiased as possible. But skeptics say those NOAA adjustments have tainted the temperature record. It's politics, it's power, it's money. Problems, they say, are just the tip of the iceberg. With government scientists supporting the global warming theory for their own financial gain. Huge uh, amount of money uh, as uh, uh, flowed into these organizations as a result of this global warming issue. We're talking three to five uh, billion dollars for NOAA alone in the last decade. NCDC scientists say the evidence is irrefutable. They have the proof it's in the record books. But skeptics say there's too much out there today to raise doubts. And at this point, it's just too early to tell. Frank, did you ask Dr. Peterson to explain that huge reduction in the number of weather reporting locations in the NCDC database from 6,000 in the 1970s to just over 1,000 today. Well, uh, Tom Peterson, the research meteorologist at the NCDC, says that what, what has happened is this, that over time, uh, the record data has grown. And when they started collecting the information, they went into history books and logs and old data that they were able to collect, and that data has been mounting. But then with uh, the transfer to digitization and modern technology, some of that, uh, some of the outposts and other places weren't accessible anymore in real time. So now what they're left with is 1,500 real-time data locations 
where they are able to access that information on the 8th of every month, and therefore they use that to extrapolate and then come up with a figure for uh, the global temperature record. Frank Forboni, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. In a few minutes, we'll talk to Anthony Watts, the man behind that study of the NCDC's temperature stations. The National Climate Data Center's response to the charges they manipulated temperature data is very interesting. So I asked the computer expert who discovered those manipulations what he thought. Michael Smith says even other nations are now questioning the data that comes out of the NCDC. You'll find in both Russia and Canada that they are continuing, continuing to report electronically, yet some of their stations are dropped. And in fact, Russia has made an announcement that they believe the pattern of dropping of their thermometers shows bias towards warming. When Russia is saying there's bias, it's not just me. Both NASA and the NCDC issued statements in the, in the interim since we talked in January, in which they indicate that the first decade of the 21st century, 2000 to 2009, was the warmest 10-year period in history. Does your probing confirm this? Well, I suggest we buy them some windows, and I don't mean the computer kind. If you look at the global weather patterns right now, we've got severe cold throughout Siberia, Russia, China. We had summer snow in the mountains. You look all across the American Midwest and out to the East Coast. I, heck, we even had, it was raining iguanas in Florida. The iguanas that were an introduced species and thrived for 30 years got so cold they were falling from the trees. They are claiming that it's the warmest ever based on a computer game. They are not claiming it based on a well-reasoned observation of the reality. So what kind of computer game is that? They have a temperature manipulation program. They start at the very front where they adjust the temperatures. They assert that those adjustments are valid, but when you look at the unadjusted temperatures, they seem perfectly reasonable. Those adjusted temperatures from NCDC have up to a degree or so of adjustment towards the warming slope. So, sounds that a little like a shell game, Michael. <laughs> it is a shell game, and it's a shell game with three players. Part of what you see when they talk about their wonderful result is you, you see a reference to using ocean buoys and satellites and various other high-tech approaches. That's the thir third shell. When you look at the data, it starts at NCDC, it moves through GISTEMP, and at the very last step, they blend in a small anomaly map for the sea surface temperatures. That anomaly map is made at the University of East Anglia. It is use what uses a tiny little bit of satellites. The satellites look at ice and estimate the amount of ice. That ice estimate is used to estimate the temperatures that are then used to make optimal interpolations of temperature that are then used to make a sea surface anomaly map, which is then blended in at the very last and optional step of GISTEMP. To say that it's satellite data is stretching the truth quite a bit. But yes, there are some tiny little amount of satellite blended in at the end. Up to that point, you have a large number of thermometer records that go through a large number of changes, often on the order of a degree or two, and then we're supposed to panic over half a degree of anomaly change? I don't think so. And you're right, of course, that the difference in those years among those 10, and also comparing those years to uh, the uh, range of other years back through history, the differences are less than a degree in the most part. Yes. Uh, when you look at individual station data, it is largely flat. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, and much good luck to you. Michael Smith's work on our government's climate data files was not a computer hack job. Those files were available to the public. You can read about his work on his blog site. There's a link at KUSI.com.